Hey everybody, this is Erica, the technology nerd who likes to film stuff, and I am going to make the follow-up video today about the BlackBerry Passport. I challenged myself to use the BlackBerry Passport faithfully as my daily driver, as the only device that I would use for an entire week. I went a little bit over a week using this as my daily driver, and now I want to talk about it, talk about the experience that I've had. And surprisingly, it's actually been a pretty decent experience with this device. I was not expecting that. I was able to get a lot of Google type of services working that I did not expect to actually get working. So I've got a lot of things working on this device. So this device has ended up being a lot more useful for someone who is reliant on Google services like myself than I would have expected. I'm still not able to get Google Plus working properly. I'm not able to get YouTube working spot on, but at least I got the app working. And I've also been able to install the Google Play Store. I've been able to install the Google Play Store and I've also been able to install applications. I can purchase applications, I can refund applications. So that along with everything else that makes the BlackBerry a joy to use, the very long battery life that this has, and that keyboard on the bottom has made it a very interesting experience. And if you're not someone who is completely reliant to say on Google Play services, this is a good device for people like that. And if you want to do some tinkering to get some services working that would take a little bit of effort, this might be the device for you to use as well if you want to try something different this time around. So I will talk about my experience. I'm going to show you up and close in person and you can decide what you think about that. So let's go ahead and check it out. So when looking at the BlackBerry Passport, the very first thing that anyone will notice is how oddly shaped this device is. It does look just like a passport. It pretty much is almost exactly the same size. You can see that the BlackBerry Passport is actually just a little bit wider than an actual passport. And if you are curious about extreme cases, here is the Xperia Z Ultra. And with the Passport right on top of it, you can see that they're about the same width. It's got this crazy pixel dense display. This is square display. I have never seen a smartphone like this lately in this generation. I've seen, you know, Palm Trios that had a square display, but not since then. I haven't seen a square display since then. So it's taken a while to adapt to. And I do have some things to say about that in terms of how applications fit on this display, but we will get into that in a little bit. So on the front of the device, you can see we have a front-facing camera. We've also got this three-row keyboard, which is quite strange because you've got the keys here, but there's no number row. And what you will notice here is that now we've got a couple more rows that pop up. These are virtual rows here. And what you can do is you can either touch here or you can simply scroll downward. You can see you can get to all different characters with this capacitive area on the keyboard. The keyboard itself is capacitive, so you can see that. So it's a little bit strange sometimes to go between texting with actual tactile keys and then bouncing to virtual keys. And you do get used to it. Now I don't even think about it at all. So in theory, this seems like a bad idea, but in practice, you really don't notice it very much anymore. I think that this overall keyboard concept is quite odd, but I do respect what they've done with the capacitive abilities of this keyboard. So if you double tap, you can see you can get this little viewfinder to pop up and you can scroll through to get to the character, the letter, the number that you would like. If you double tap again, it will go away. Instead of having to press this delete button, you can simply swipe and it will delete a word for you. If you go all the way across, you can end up seeing you can delete an entire line very easily. I really like what BlackBerry Limited has done with the word completion, being able to use this capacitive keyboard. You can see that there's three different choices. If I swipe upward towards any of these, it will complete for me. So therefore, the, or is there anything? So when typing and I see that I've made a mistake, Instead of having to break my groove and reach upward and hit hello, I can simply just swipe upward and it fixes it for me. So this is a very odd system that they have here, but it's one that I've ended up actually enjoying. I have used normal BlackBerry keyboards and after a while, this has just become very seamless to me. Oh, and before I forget, another thing that I really like with this keyboard is being able to swipe up and down. It lets me keep my thumbs on the keyboard at all times. I don't have to break and go and scroll through things. I can, but I tend to like the feeling and the feedback of this plastic rather than going up and sliding against the glass. 
it's an experience. It's something that's very different, but I find that it works tremendously well. As for how these keys feel, they're nice and clicky. You can see that they've got a slanted shape to them, which helps you find which keys are what. That way you know where a key starts and where a key ends. So that is a standard BlackBerry Fair. BlackBerry is well known for their keyboards. One thing that people tend to know about Blackberries is that over time, the keys start getting easier to press. When I first started off with this keyboard, I found that it was a little bit hard to press on these keys, but over time, they're becoming softer. It breaks in, if you will. At least that is the feeling to me, most definitely. The experience I have from going between a virtual keyboard and a physical keyboard is that I tend to be a little bit more accurate with a physical keyboard, but I do notice that over time, because I have to press down and put more force to get each key to register, it does end up hurting my hands over time. I've also got small hands and the form factor of this device is a little bit odd, so that's not shocking that this would tend to end up hurting my hands and my wrists after a while. So it is a weird transition to go between the virtual and then back over to tactile keys. For the sake of carpal tunnel and my wrists and any type of repetitive motion syndrome, I find that it's better to have virtual keys, but you really can't beat a physical keyboard. So going around the rest of the device, we have a front facing camera right here. We've got our receiver, proximity sensor, ambient light sensor. On the left hand side, we've got nothing, just plain. On the right hand side, we've got the volume rockers, which give a nice feedback. And then we've also got a button here in the middle. Welcome to the BlackBerry Assistant. And that brings up the BlackBerry Assistant. Then at the top, we've got a power button and a standard headphone jack. I was complaining in the unboxing about the power button being placed right here at the top and finding that to be awkward to reach upward. But one thing that I forgot to mention is that, look at this, you can simply go upward. I played with the BlackBerry Q10 and I was able to do this as well. So I find that this feature works quite well to turn on the device. One thing I noticed with having small hands, one of the features of the BlackBerry is to be able to peek. You can go upward like so and pull the side, but I don't know if it's my small fingers or what because I can't reach all the way over to here to be able to pull upward to peek appropriately. So with my small hands and the large dimensions of this phone, I find it very hard to use that feature. You can see that that's the range of motion I get. So that sucks a little bit. I can't get over to the BlackBerry Hub. I don't know how many ladies will end up being interested in this device, but this is a very business-minded device, does great for answering emails. So there might be some business-minded ladies out there, but just keep in mind, you peoples with tiny hands, that it becomes a little bit hard to use the BlackBerry in its full glory because you can't go all the way to the side. Now on the backhand side, we have a 13 megapixel shooter here with a single LED flash. It's got optical image stabilization, which is a really nice thing. I'm surprised to see that this camera is actually pretty full featured. Then lastly, at the bottom, we've got stereo speakers. This isn't just dual speakers. This is actually stereo speakers with a left and right channel. We've got our micro USB charging port and a microphone. And I find it very difficult to remove this little cover here. This is not something that I would do very often. Ends up breaking my thumbnail off. Ouch, ouch. So there you have it. Underneath is an SD card slot and we've also got a nano SIM card slot. So that is the extent of what we have here looking around this Blackberry. So now swiping up from the bottom, standard Blackberry Fair, we've got the Blackberry 10 OS. And I find the interface to be very nice and smooth. We've just got several panels with app icons. I do like how we have the multitasking. If you go to the far left, you can see our applications that are currently open. You can go between them. And then if you want to get back out of an application, there is no home button. So you just swipe upward and it brings you right back into this panel here. Then if you go again all the way to the left, you see your Blackberry hub. And then if you pull to the left again, you can see all the different categories underneath the BlackBerry Hub. So you'll see things like your Gmail accounts, notifications from any messaging application that you have. So I have tended to like the interface of the BlackBerry. I think it's very elegant, it's very simple. If I want to get into the camera, you can see that it's right here at the right-hand corner at the bottom. 
You can easily get into the dialer just by touching the left hand corner. You can also access the camera from the lock screen. Now once on the lock screen, you can pull downward and it brings you into this clock, it turns off notifications so you don't get bothered during the nighttime. You can set your alarm as well. Then when inside of an application, you can use one finger to pull down to access the menu or the settings for that application. And if you use two fingers to go down from the top, you get access to your quick settings panel. So this is a really, really nice interface. I have no complaints about the interface whatsoever. Ooh, before I forget, there's also something I really like on the lock screen. You can see that we see our notifications here. Then if we touch on one of them, it gives you a preview of the notifications that are available. Then if you tap again, it says tap to open and it will bring you right into the app to look right at the notification. I think that that's really excellent. I also really like that notifications now appear at the top here and you can actually reply right from the notification on the top. If you touch it, it goes right into it. It's hard to show in a demo on my actual device because it's so fleeting, but this is a nice feature. Now, in addition to a nice interface, we've also got some nice features as well. So from this quick settings panel here, we have the ability to turn on the flashlight. This is always such a great setting to have. We also have device monitor, tells us the battery percentage. And if you go right into it, it gives you a good idea of what's using the battery. I think it's quite comprehensive. It also shares things such as mobile data, storage, CPU, memory, Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi usage rather tells you how much data. So this gives a very nice amount of information about your device and what's using it, what's going on with it. So I think they do quite a good job with this here. Then underneath the system settings, we have an advanced interaction tab where you can lift to wake, you can flip to mute. Then you can also flip to save power. So trying some of these features out, if we have the device flat on a desk and we lift it upward towards our face, you can see the display turns on. Also now, if we flip to save power, it's going to turn the display off once it hits the desk. But when we pick it back up again, you can see it's off and it turns itself back on. So we can do that again. It's gonna go off and it turns itself back on. It's going to turn itself back on whether you have lift to wake activated or not. It seems to be part of this setting. So if you turn it over like this, when you lift it upward, it's going to automatically turn back on for you. So this is a very work-minded type of a setting. If you sit at a desk all day and you just need to check your phone real quick, peek, look at notifications, take it, flip it back over, it turns it right back off. You don't have to do much. You don't have to think about much. So I think that's actually quite nice. If you're in a meeting, I can see that to be quite useful in a way that won't insult the people around you. You can easily check your phone, put it right back down, and it's not affecting you anymore. It's not a distraction anymore. So now I wanted to take a second to thank my sponsors over at audible.com so much for making content creation possible. If you don't know who Audible is, they're a leading online provider of downloadable audiobooks with over 150,000 titles from so many different genres, so many different things to listen to. And what I'm listening to right now is called Year of No Sugar, a memoir. This is the unabridged version by Eve O. Schwab. So what I've been looking into is New Year's resolutions, and I want to really start eating more healthy. Sugar is something that is in everything. It's in processed foods of everything. There's even sugar in things that we wouldn't even think that there is sugar in. And so I found this book to be interesting because it's about a family who goes an entire year without really eating any sugar. They, they try to cut sugar out entirely, and I find this interesting because Eve decides to go and talk about the mechanisms of what sugar can actually do to the body. We're talking about fructose. And it kind of freaked me out a little bit as I was listening to this. It did freak me out. And I'm like, oh, I really want to start eating better. The sugar is really not a good thing. It frightened me. So I think it's entertaining. And if you are wanting to get rid of sugar in your diet, you want to know what it's like to cut it out entirely, this is an interesting memoir. I would definitely listen to it. So if you want to check out this book or any other book, follow audible.com slash Erica. You can try an Audible service for free. And also your first book is for free. And if you don't like this audiobook for any reason, you can exchange it at any time, no questions asked. And also since they are an Amazon company, you can log on easily with your Amazon information. So if you want to check out this book, check it out at audible.com slash Erica. And let me know what you think about this. Now, taking a bit of a look at specifications, this device is 
pretty well up there with high spec Android devices. You can see we've got a Qualcomm Snapdragon 801 SoC, 2.2 gigahertz, quad core CPU, Adreno 330 GPU. We've got three gigabytes of RAM, 32 gigabytes of internal storage, and you can expand up to 128 gigabytes by the micro SD card slot. This display I pointed out a little bit earlier, square display. We've got a 1440 by 1440 resolution. The pixel density is insanely high. This is a very nice display. I was not expecting the display to actually be this nice. Everything looks very crisp. Everything looks very sharp text. It looks just delightful on this device. Also, if you don't like how the display looks right out of the box, you have the ability to go underneath display color settings. Then you can mess with the white balance. It's actually quite nice right where it is. It could be just a little bit warmer. Right there is a nice warm white. That tends to be what I prefer. When I measured the color temperature of this device out of the box it's somewhere around 7,500 Kelvin, where I like 6,500, I prefer those D65 whites. You also can mess around with the color saturation. That's not really something that I'd like to do. I want to keep it where it is. Although when I did the measurements, I could see that there is quite a bit of saturation added to some colors. And also it seems that BlackBerry Limited has done some things with the gamma as well. They make an S curve, they make the display pop, they give it an artificial contrasty effect by boosting shadows and then making the highlights lighter. So I would say this display has a popping type of effect to it. It's not a boring, bland display. What really does it for me though is that pixel density. I really like it. The viewing angles are pretty all right as well. And I'm pleased that I don't see any light bleeding. When you go to watch something like Netflix, for example, you can see that we have quite a bit of black bars, quite a bit of letterboxing on the top and bottom. So it's very helpful that this display does not have an issue with light bleeding because that would just be atrocious and interfering with the picture. So now I want to start talking about applications. I have ended inside of the Netflix app to begin with. I want to say that this app that I have right here is actually an older APK that I went and found online. You can see that my version is 3.4.0. The reason I have this version is because if you go and get the updated version of Netflix, it's going to not scale properly. And what happens is it takes the image and makes it like a one-to-one -one aspect and you simply can't watch Netflix that way. I'm sure that people who are getting this device are not going to be minded towards watching a lot of media like this, but you can. And if you get an older APK version of Netflix, you certainly can actually watch the entire thing instead of having it a one-to-one -one aspect where you can't see half people's faces anymore. So that is one thing about this device is that in order to get it working properly, in order to get some applications working properly, you have to be willing to go and dig yourself, learn yourself what you need. I will put some links in the description so that it will make it easier for you if you're thinking about getting this device or if you already have it and you're watching this video right now, you can see my links in the description because I'm about to show you some other things here. So an obvious takeaway here is that not all applications that you put on this device are going to scale properly. Obviously, the size of the display is square and some applications just don't know how to deal with this. What's nice about this device is that you do have quite a bit of options for installing applications. You have the BlackBerry world. I think this is going to be for the hardcore BlackBerry people. Otherwise, people who are coming from things like iPhones or Androids will probably be more interested in what's offered with the Amazon App Store or even side-loading applications. Then you can install things like Snap, which are like a Google Play Store client, which simply grab APKs from the Google Play Store and allow you to install them. But the best option by far is what Cobalt, a developer Cobalt from Crackberry offers, which is an actual working Play Store, like I mentioned in the beginning. With this Play Store, I'm able to log in you can see my account here, so this is truly fully functional. I can download pre-purchased apps, I can purchase new applications, and I can get refunds for my applications as well. And this Cobalt guy has gotten so many things to work. So I'm delighted that I'm able to download a lot of my games. I'm going to include a link in the description so that you can download the APK files. It's very simple. Follow the link in the description. You go to the website, you can download the files and install them right from there. You don't have to sideload or do anything. But basically I've installed this 
Play Store, this BlackBerry Google ID, and Google account. All three of these in cooperation have allowed me to get Google Play services working to some extent. I've been able to get Play Music working. Cobalt was able to patch YouTube and get YouTube working. I'm now able to log into the Chrome browser. I can get access to all of my bookmarks. And now Google Maps is working seamlessly as well. So that's so much thank you to this guy Cobalt from Crackberry. Now keep in mind that not everything works. There are some Google applications that don't work, such as Google Plus or the YouTube Creator Studio. You can get into Google Play Movies. It lets you log into your account. But once you go to try to play a video, it just gives you an error. But it is nice and I've been able to get Google Play Music working and I do have full access to playing all of my music so that makes me very very happy. Now I don't have an exhaustive list of everything that is working. That's something that's probably going to be trial and error. That's something that if you want one of these devices that you should probably try out. But if you're someone like me who really relies on a lot of Google stuff then you're probably better off getting something like an iPhone or an Android phone because this did take me quite a bit of fiddling around. I was able to get my games on here. I'm very happy to have those. And anything else that I'm not able to have access to in form of an application, such as I said that Google Plus is not working and YouTube is not perfect, I am able to use either the Chrome browser or the BlackBerry browser to compensate. Now the BlackBerry browser is very functional. It is a very functional browser. It has Flash as well. But I do notice that not everything works. So if you're someone who needs to go on Google Plus and to reply to other people, if you want to make sure that this person is replied to, hello, Alan, then what you need to do is you have to go underneath your settings, go underneath developer tools, then you need to hit desktop mode because that's going to allow you to actually link to that person that you are replying to. Otherwise, it just doesn't recognize or pull up that person at all. Same thing goes with YouTube. If I am trying to reply to a person, I really need to make sure that developer mode is on. So while I can use the web browser to compensate where there are not applications on this device, I do add a lot of extra steps. And this is a very nice big display, but look how tiny this is. This is not meant for mobile, obviously. So I add a lot of extra steps in here and it takes me a lot of time to do something that would take me a very short amount of time on an Android device or an iPhone where I have an actual application. So applications are important. I can use this device faithfully and I can do just fine with it for a week or however long, but I end up getting a little bit frustrated after a while since I do rely heavily on Google. But check this out, this is a real work in progress, so please check out the links in the description so that you can check into this for yourself. As a note about games, with the Google Play Store you can download large games that are over 50 megabytes. If we go underneath Android here you can see that we do have OBB files. We have the expansion files for Asphalt 8 and also for The Rube 2. So this really is mimicking an Android device at present. Now, unfortunately, I see that when loading applications that are large like Asphalt 8 or even the Room 2, it takes a long time to load and to get to the next screen. Anytime there's loading, it takes a long time to load. I don't know if it has a poor IO performance or what. Once in the game, once playing the game, it's not entirely smooth, but it's pretty playable. It's just that I would rather go for an Android device and play these big games than on the BlackBerry. This is certainly not the device for this. Now as for battery life, this thing has a huge battery that you simply can't remove, unfortunately. I have seen the battery life to be a little bit confusing since I haven't used this for really more than a little over a week. I haven't gotten that full feeling of what the battery life is like just yet. In general though, when I'm not consuming a lot of media and I don't have the display on high brightness, I tend to be able to use this device for a good two days. But once I start using Skype, which Skype completely kills any battery, or I start watching YouTube videos, or I start watching Netflix, I can see that the battery can drain from media quite quickly. Plus, who knows what all the Google stuff on here is doing now. This has been more fairly recent for me putting all this Google stuff on here, so I'm going to have to see what the battery life is like. 
But in general though, when I'm just using this as a mobile office and browsing the web and typing emails and stuff like that, the battery life is really, really good. Now the last thing that I want to talk a little bit about is the camera. This is not an exhaustive review. This is simply just my challenge for myself and sharing with you all the experience of what this is like to use as a person coming from Android or even an iPhone. So non-exhaustive, but I've been pretty pleased so far with the camera interface. Surprisingly, this is pretty fully functional. You have the option to change your aspect ratio. I do have to admit that it's a bit awkward to use a square display when taking pictures, but you do have the option for HDR. You've got an auto mode, you have an action mode, you can take pictures of text, just say on a whiteboard, nighttime mode, beach or snow. So these are your standard type presets. And we've also got extra settings. For the rear camera, you can choose all the way up to 1080p at 60 frames per second. Very happy about that. You can use face detection for photos. You can turn on video stabilization. I wonder if it's optical image stabilization in video or if they decide to use some type of software stabilization. And then you have the option for continuous autofocus in video. You have the ability to control everything at will. I think the interface is nice and it's very simple. You've got normal, time shift, burst mode, panorama. So this is a nice functional camera in an awkward form factor. You also have the ability to switch to that front facing camera. Hello. When I played around with the BlackBerry Q10, I was quite pleased by the video quality and also the audio quality. So I'm gonna have to take this out a little bit and test it and include that after this. We are standing outside the original Starbucks. <laughs> uh -huh. uh -huh. Alright, let's not get hit by cars. People just walk right in front of cars here. Apparently that's okay. Image stabilization is on. Wait, Erica. Are you recording video? Yes, I'm testing out the video stabilization. Hi guys. Oh yes. So this is Katie. Hello. And this is Melody. <laughs> and we are testing out the BlackBerry Passport video stabilization. Ventures. Lavender stress ball. So it's supposed to be soothing while you squeeze. With a fresh scent of lavender. Believe. I do believe in fairies. Why do you not focus? Wow. No, not very well. This is the magic shop in Pike Place Market. I'm covering the microphone this entire time. Here's the microphone on the bottom. I wonder. I wonder how many of the videos I've taken so far are totally covered. You can't hear anything. 
It's not focusing. <laughs> well, I guess it's all good for the review. Like magic, we're gone. Okay. What? <laughs> So we are on the observation deck of the Space Needle. This is a long way down. I think they said 521 feet. That's just my memory serving me. Check that out. Hello, Seattle. Seattle. everybody for watching this has been erica the technology nerd who likes to film stuff please rate comment and subscribe again this has not been an exhaustive review this has just been what my impressions have been like over about two weeks of using this device i have enjoyed my time with it although as i mentioned i do get a little bit frustrated because i have to take some extra steps in using the web browser in order to compensate where i don't have working applications like google plus or not being able to use YouTube Creator Studio or to respond on YouTube. Again, these are not things that everyone is going to struggle with. So this is a device that I think if you go ahead and load the Google Play Store on, you should be more than happy with a lot of the applications that you can put on this. I think for someone who is not Google dependent will be very happy with this device if they want a change, if you want a keyboard. The experience of using this device is quite nice. It's very different but it is an experience and it kind of is fun just to use it because it is different. It turns heads. I ended up really liking how vast and wide this display is, especially when scrolling through web pages. You can see a lot of text across. So very, very interesting device. I can't end up using this as a sole daily driver forever because this would end up being just a little bit too complicated or complex for me to get everything working the way that I need it to. But I'm not going to say that this is a terrible device. I enjoyed my time with it. I do recommend it in terms of being a real tool for productivity, especially if you're someone who is writing a lot of emails or needs accuracy with a keyboard. This works very well. And I love those little keyboard shortcuts. So if you're on the edge, get it on Amazon, test it out for 30 days and return it. You know, Amazon's great with their return policy, I found out. So check it out, give it a chance and have a good night.